The struggle is real. Four Navy sailors have died by apparent suicide at the same facility in Virginia. The deaths all happened within the last few weeks. They are sparking fresh concern about a fleet-wide mental health crisis. NBC News digital reporter Melissa Chan has been following this story. And Melissa, uh, we know the name uh, names of two of the four uh, sailors we're talking about here. What have you been able to learn about them? We know, sadly, that they had been struggling for a while. Cody Lee Decker was 22. He had just become a first-time father. And over the summer, he was moved off of a ship to this facility known as Marmac because of mental health issues. Sailors told me that toxic leadership there made things worse. And then exactly one week later, Cameron Armstrong, who was also 22, took his own life. His mother, pictured there, said she knew he was feeling depressed, but she didn't know how bad things were. The overwhelming amount of hopelessness um, that is felt at that command um, is is evident that it is occurring from even before these tragic losses. We're putting these, these Band-Aids on bullet holes that are, are gaping wounds at this point. Putting Band-Aids on bullet holes, she said, uh, you know, what do health experts say needs to change, not just at this facility, across the Navy, across the military, even speaking to her as a level of transparency within the military that we don't often get? Right. If, if you look at DOD statistics, nearly 17 out of every 100,000 Navy sailors died by suicide last year. So they're calling for a more systematic change. So not just suicide prevention seminars and emails when there's a rash of suicides, but more critical reforms that could prevent them in the first place. The, the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, has spoken about mental health more than any of his predecessors and the need for, for openness about that within our armed forces. Has the Navy responded to these particular deaths? The Navy gave a statement, or, or a MARMAC spokesperson gave a statement saying it was taking a proactive approach to support its members and that chaplains and mental health professionals were available. Okay, so I'm not going to comment on the military culture. Because, for one thing, I want to dig into it a little bit more. But for another thing, this cultural challenge affects everybody across the board. It's not just the military. And I can talk to you about this from the perspective of having been a labor management leader when I was with the federal government and having to all the time go to the mat to negotiate certain things on behalf of the employees and almost invariably have to come to management again at midterm talk about, look, I thought we agreed to this and these are the stories we're here. This is not happening. They're not towing the line, so to speak. And I'm telling you, I had it up to my eyeballs with, oh, that's a training issue. It's not a training issue. If your culture, if your organizational culture is not conducive to employees trusting enough to be open about things that they are not required by law to disclose, unless your culture is going to facilitate trust, you aren't going to know about the silent battles that these employees are fighting. This is the challenge. For upper management, the people in the CEO suites, the people in the ivory tower, so to speak. Please understand that this challenge with mental health is not about a new tactic, a new fad that we're doing. It's not about that. And while we have all jumped on this DEI bandwagon, We've got to understand and acknowledge that people's mental health is a part of the whole diversity dynamic. People do not switch themselves off from their entire lives when they enter the organizational doors. They don't cut all of that off. It's who they are. And so when we walk into a culture that expected us to perform, perform, perform with no consideration at all about the traumatic backgrounds we carry with us, maybe some of us are in traumatic situations at home. Maybe some of us are suffering PTSD. Maybe of some of us are suffering from complex PTSD. And we're human beings and not robots. We are not going to be able to cut that off. 
Let's say you're having a good day. You're still bringing your entire life into the workplace. And when we fail to acknowledge and respond to these mental health needs in the workplace, then we are doing ourselves a disservice. I saw a woman right in front of my eyes cycle in and out a bipolar situation. I mean, I watch her cycle from high to low to high to low within a 45 minute period of time in front of me. And the next thing I know, I'm hearing stories. I was a union president, so that's why I knew about this stuff. I'm hearing stories about, oh, they locked her out of her office. The office, man, people from the main regional office flew out to the field office where she was and put her picture up in the lobby and told them not to let her in because they were getting complaints about her behavior. Now, they wound up trying to suspend and fire this woman. They didn't even consider her mental health challenges. And when she reported those mental health challenges, what did they do? Hey, mighty funny you didn't get that diagnosis before. I'm telling you, as a union president, when the regional administrator looked me in my face and talked, look, so let me take you back. This woman had an accident on her way to work, so she got there late. When she got there late, they wouldn't allow her in her office. They were upstairs removing her computer and everything so they could take it somewhere and look at it and examine it. Apparently, they had been getting some complaints from some of her employees about her behavior. In the meantime, they suspend her pending the outcome of the investigation. I'm a union president. The union gets involved. In the meantime, well, no, I wait a minute. I, the union did not get involved because she was on a supervisory level and that was outside of our purview. Once you became a certain level, then you were outside of the bargaining unit. So, But I'm still hearing about this, this friend of mine. Long story short, it turns out that she was bipolar. Now, you can get some violent behaviors when you're bipolar. It, that's part of the whole thing. But when she brought them that diagnosis, which she had just gotten herself, this woman was in her 50s and didn't know she was bipolar, had been suffering the consequences all her life. They were treating her for depression and nobody was addressing the fact that she goes from depression and at 60 miles an hour, she goes to highs and stays there. And then you have all of the behaviors that kind of are kind of risky and then you, you can be hard to get along with, yada, yada, yada. So she was shocked because she called me talking about, yeah, Linda, um, I just couldn't believe it. Do you know what they diagnosed me with? And I told her bipolar. She said, yes. I said, I know I could see it. Now, let's fast forward to months later, maybe a year later, when they had suspended her. They had to put her on administrative leave. So that means that she was getting paid for the whole year or so that she was fighting this thing. So she's off in the Bahamas enjoying herself. She's still getting paid. And the bottom line was when she filed that EEO complaint, she won. So they lost. So they had to give her all of her job back. And 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 any kind of difference between her actual administrative pay to her to, to up to the amount of money she should have been making so they would have had to make that up okay and if any part of her being off fighting this thing was her annual leave or her sick leave they had to give that back bottom line the agency lost money lost money lost 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 money so all of this has been settled she's back at work it's all settled I was also friends with the reader administrator, so I'm talking to him one day, and I was trying to tell him even back then. And I, I, I ain't going to lie, y'all. I ain't going to lie. I kind of had to behind this guy for months. I didn't want to look at him, didn't want to talk to him. But one day we were talking in his office, and I was 
it, some kind of way there was another situation that was up. And because, you know, not every union president is going to have the kind of psychological background I had, the training I had, but I always utilize it and try to tell management, well, you want to consider this because, you know, that's a protected class, and if it's a medical issue, you don't want to put your behind in a vice grip. It, it came out in about, yeah, we don't want to make the same mistake we made with blah, 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 and said the woman's name. Oh, so now you're beginning to get it. Now you want to admit you made a mistake too freaking late because you lost a lot of money in the meantime when you could have just supported her and that's what's going on in some of these situations people are being disciplined when they should not be disciplined they should be supported to address whatever cognitive issues or mental health issues that are interfering with their productivity and we just don't get it so while the army has probably got, look, so I'm going to just say my opinion on this article, on this news article, okay? Understand that I'm not speaking for any of the families. I am not speaking from any insider knowledge. I'm only speaking from my own lived experience as a labor management leader who negotiated national contracts and handled grievances on behalf of employees from my own experience as a federal employee and my own experience from a mental health perspective and a, and a business consultant. So I'm going to have to leave all of that to the families, but I'll tell you this, when you have an entrenched negative culture such as what appears to be the case in this situation with these suicides in the Navy, then you got to clean house. There's an old boy network. There's an unspoken system in place there where people have got to not be stigmatized. Just look at this. According to the American Psychological Association, the prevalence of mental illness is astounding. 90% of the U.S. population have suffered some form of mental illness. As if that's not enough. 70% of adults, that's 223 million people, have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their lives. And here's the challenge, non-disclosure. Employees don't want to deal with the stigma of mental health challenges because the culture is not conducive to trust. And when others know that you are seeking help for a mental health issue, it can foster stigmatization on the part of not only employees, but on the part of leadership as well. And when that leadership is toxic, you are not going to know what's going on with your employees because they suffer in silence. Now, these people are not asking to be stigmatized so that everybody know you got a mental health problem. Everybody know you're getting treated and people are looking at you like you are a you are the problem. See, all of that's got to be rooted out and that's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but you have to be determined. So in a situation where I'm looking at management for the 900th time and they telling me, oh, anecdotal. That's what they throw at you like, oh, that's anecdotal. Okay, you can slap anecdotal on it all day if you want to, but the truth of the matter is I, I don't see you gathering any scientific data. And unless and until you do, this is what we got on the table to deal with, what, whether you, you want to label it anecdotal or not. The other thing they would tell me is, oh, that that's a management style. That's management. What does that mean? So you throw a management style? Yeah. Their management style stinks, and it needs to be dealt with. So just because it's a management style doesn't make it right. It's not right. And here's the one that made me almost blow up at the negotiating table. We in midterm, I can tell them for the 900th time about the same dead gum thing. Oh, that's a training issue. Wait, hold, 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 hold the phone. 
It seems like we've been talking about training issues for months. Where is the accountability? This is not about training. This is about holding people accountable to the training and expectations already set forth in this contract. And unless and until they're going to be held accountable, we're going to be back here talking about this again. I'm not up for that. Okay? It shut it down. No more talk across the table. They handled their business. So in order to change your culture, you're going to have to have clearly delineated and communicated expectations. You're going to have to clearly communicate what the consequences for failure to meet those standards will be. And you have to, without exception, implement whatever the repercussions are for people who fail to step to the guidelines. You cannot be picking and freaking choosing who you're going to hold to that standard or not. And it comes from the top down. It comes from the top down. There's a whole bunch more I could say about this military mess. But I'm going to leave that alone. We're going to let that play out in the news and see what they're going to do with the guidelines they're supposed to already be following. But my thing is this. Don't be just jumping on this suicide thing, this this bandwagon of, oh, oh, now we got so many suicides in such and such amount of time at such and such a place. And so you need to get out there and determine what is the problem out there at that place, whether it's in your organization or not, wherever it is, whether it's in the military, in your organization or not, you need to get out there and determine what's going on out here and what heads need to roll because of it. Stop blaming the victims. There's a problem here, okay? And I have seen it over and over again as a labor management leader. I have seen it overlooked. Everybody turns their head. Everybody doesn't want to know about it because I'm on the leadership side. I'm on the management side. So I got to hold up, hold my manager. You don't know what's right and what's wrong. And let's deal with what's wrong here. Cody Decker is my nephew. And what I want us all to remember with respect to the news story that started this, this video is that these are human beings. And in the wake of their losses, people are grieving. Families are grieving. Families have to deal with this loss for the rest of their lives. They are more than statistics. They're human beings. And the tragedy of this loss is unspeakable. Always remember your greatest power is realizing the truth of who you are. Know that truth. Thank you for joining me today on When Your Mind Becomes the Scene of the Crime podcast. Schedule your free breakthrough session now at lindafwilliams.com. That's lindafwilliams.com.